Hi everyone, um, it's now 1230, so we're gonna get started. My name is Melissa. I do community engagement and government relations with Waterloo Greenway. Um, I'm excited to be welcoming you today to our next virtual tour. Um, before we get started, I wanted to just cover a few helpful reminders to help everyone have the best virtual tour experience. Um, to help us with audio quality, please keep yourselves on mute. Um, if you're on your computer or joining us by phone, um, just click the microphone icon and please make sure it's red so we don't interfere um, and have mic feedback or um, disable the ability to hear our speakers. We are recording today's webinar and we'll be sharing it on social media. Um, so if you are not able to stick around for the full time or wanna share it with others, um, you'll be able to find it on our YouTube page and social media accounts. Like I mentioned today, we are uh, excited to be sharing another virtual tour opportunity. This is our third. This is our third tour opportunity and we're excited to be presenting this in partnership with our friends at the City of Austin and our Watershed Protection Department. We'll be covering the Waller Creek Tunnel, um, which begins in Waterloo Park at Waterloo Greenway. Um, it's an important feature because of the historic flooding along Waller Creek um, and has really changed the potential for Waterloo Greenway and our future parks. So we'll be getting into more details as we move along. Thank you for joining us again. And with that, I would like to pass it over to our Director of Planning and Design, John Rigdon. Great, thanks, Melissa. And thank you all for joining us today to learn more about uh, Waterloo Greenway and also the flood control tunnel specifically. Um, could you go advance, Melissa? Um, so, you know, just as a, as a background, I'll provide some context about Waterloo Park, um, the overall Greenway project and our construction progress to date. Uh, many of you may have seen it's a construction site and a lot of work is happening there. And so I'll give you a little preview, sneak peek of what that looks like before I hand it off um, to folks to talk more about the tunnel. Um, Waterloo Park, as Melissa mentioned, is uh, phase one of 35 acres of parks and open space um, along Waller Creek. Um, as she also mentioned, a lot of this uh, you know, redevelopment of the public space is made possible by the flood control tunnel, which took a significant amount of the land out of the floodplain. And we'll get more to that when we dive into the tunnel, but it's an important feature um, throughout the park system. Um, Waterloo Park specifically is 10.5 acres of that 35 acres and has historically been a park and is between 12th and 15th Street um, and Red River and Trinity Street. Um, here's a view of what the park will look like once completed. Um, you know, the park has many elements and, you know, in this image we're really highlighting uh, one of those elements, which is the ability, the amphitheater in the middle of the park, which gives, you know, us the ability to have events of, you know, all sizes up to 5,000, um, including in the evenings. And so you can get a sense of what that might look like um, with this uh, steel, white steel canopy um, over top of the stage, which provides shade and rain coverage. And I'll, I'll show a, a more recent image of that. Um, next, please. Um, just to show you sort of some of the progress of construction, prior to the end of 2019, uh, we had already been under construction for, for about a year, but a lot of the work that was happening on site was, was underground and was moving the earth around to really set the stage for the amenities that you'll experience in the park. Um, so, you know, in 2019, at the end of the year, uh, we've done a lot of moving the earth around, transplanting some really important trees and getting everything ready. Uh, and then next, please. Um, and then by uh, this month, um, you can see how significantly the site has changed. Um, you know, in the sort of background on the right there, you can see the steel canopy over top of the stage. You can see the concrete building that sort of you know, wedges its way into the hillside. It has um, restrooms and concessions and storage spaces and back of house spaces to really allow large events, but but hide into the landscape during normal park use. And one you know other notable thing you can really see here is you can see this lawn that stretches out over top of the pond for the flood control tunnel, and that's on the left of your screen over there. Um, and you know we'll talk more about the pond and, and its purpose underneath that, but that really allows us to reclaim about a half acre of parkland. It'll serve as the, as the back of this great lawn um, and sort of viewing space for events and performances in the amphitheater. Uh, next, please. Um, I'm going to walk through some aerial views of the site 
we're going to work our way from Red River Street and go counterclockwise around the site to 15th and Trinity, then 12th, um, just to give some context before, before I pass it off um, to talk more about the tunnel. Um, this is sort of hovering above Red River Street. Kind of imagine you're above the Brackenridge Hospital garage looking down at the site. Um, these photos are, are very recent. So you can see some of the uh, debris in the pond from a recent flood event, and we'll, we'll talk a lot more about how that works. Um, you can see that lawn structure. Sorry, if you jump back. Um, you can see the lawn structure in the, in the foreground there, and then the steel canopy um, uh, in, in the background. Um, also, I'll point out in this image in the background, and I don't know, Melissa, if you could put the cursor over it, we have the family pavilion building. We're going to have an upcoming uh, discussion about a presentation about the process and design of that family pavilion building. So that's coming up soon, uh, and I would highly recommend you all join us for that presentation as well. Uh, next, please. Moving counterclockwise to the north, this is a view from 15th Street looking down the park towards downtown. On your left there, you can see Waller Creek um, as it moves toward the inlet facility. Um, and the pond. So that's a key feature of the park is the way Waller Creek moves through it. Um, you can also see a lot of the existing trees on site um, that we're really enhancing as we as we relocate trees and build the site and plant almost 500 new trees. Uh, next, please. This view is right over top of the canopy looking east. Um, you can see that the canopy is made up of uh, steel I-beams, which sort of uh, lattice together to provide shade. They also have a rain coverage inside of them, which allows the performers to stay dry or during park use, folks who wanna hang out in that shade canopy on stage can eat lunch or do other activities on stage and stay dry. Um, the canopy is almost complete. Uh, we're working on putting in the rain protection now. Um, that, that structure will have approximately five miles of steel uh, in it when it's completed. So a very complex structure, but it provides a really cool uh, shade opportunity underneath it uh, for performers and, and park users. Next, please. Moving a little further to the south, um, this image sort of is hovering over that family pavilion building, which is in the bottom left. And then you can see this uh, sort of snaking pathway that moves through the site. In the center, it lifts off, of, off the ground and becomes a bridge almost. And we're just now pulling the forms off of that concrete structure, which is a really, really cool moment for the park. That'll be the primary entrance into the park, providing ADA accessibility, as well as great views out over the landscape. Uh, next, please. Similar image looking from the corner of 12th and Trinity Street. I think this gives a really good perspective of the significant grade change in the park. Um, from this top corner um, down to the corner on your, on your top right, there's about 50 feet of elevation change. And you can see that you know, through the way we've had to sort of snake this pathway through in order to make those grades work for ADA and bike accessibility. But also, you, know, you can see Waller Creek down there in the distance at the low point of the site. Um, and you know, that's informed a lot of the flooding and building historically throughout uh, the park system in downtown. If there's been more building up high and along Waller Creek, it's been prone to flood events. And that'll come up more as we talk about the tunnel um, you can also see that thin profile of that elevated uh, structure of the of the walkway in the middle there. And Melissa, I don't know if you can highlight over that with your cursor, but we've got that concrete uh, bridge structure in the middle, which the forms are just coming off of, and that will be a really cool experience. Also from this view, you can see all those wonderful heritage trees that we have on site, um, and those will provide shade. We've also relocated about uh, five trees on site in order to provide more shade and we'll be planting about 500 new trees. So really building up and enhancing that shade canopy but utilizing those existing trees. Uh, next please. This is looking from 12th Street North towards the new medical school um, and you can see the, the park um, gets narrower as it goes north and also sort of right right below us and if you'll jump to the next slide we have a key sort of distinguishing feature of the site, which is the Waller, Waller Creek Flood Control Tunnel and specifically the inlet facility and pond. And I've highlighted those in orange. Um, that is a working facility on site, which provides uh, you know, key operational support uh, for the Waller Creek Tunnel, um, which you know, has various inlets along the creek. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that 
Um, but, you know, you can see the pond and the building, and how the park was really shaped around that because that was built first um, and provides that key benefit of moving the park spaces out of the floodplain. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it to Kristen Pipkin and Thomas Guerra from the Watershed Protection Department to talk more about how the tunnel concept came about, how it was developed, and then operationally how it performs. Hello? Hi, we can hear you, Christian. Hey. Okay, I appreciate it. I, I apologize. Um, I have my phone in my ear. I'm having some technical difficulties in, in hearing everybody and hearing the presentation today. So apologize for, uh, for the delay. And, um, and, and I guess thank you, John, for uh, passing the, the presentation over to myself. My name is Kristen Pipkin, and then, and then Tomas um, Guerrera is also um, going to be co-presenting with me as we Hey, Kristen, we lost your audio. Thomas, would you mind jumping in while Kristen is uh, figuring out her phone situation? I'm sorry that we're having some technical difficulties today. Yes, I'll jump in here. Hi. My name is Thomas Guerra. I'm the uh, operation maintenance supervisor of the Walla Creek Tunnel here at 15th at Waterloo Park. Uh, just some uh, information here on the foundation of the Waterloo Greenway. The tunnel removed 28 acre, acres of land and 42 structures and 12 bridges crosses from the floodplain that provide an opportunity to create a signature park and open space systems in the downtown area. The photo you see right now is the, the outlet itself. The uh, outlet is 26 foot diameter pipe there, as you can see, it's drained at this time uh, uh, on this photo, and it goes up 60 feet before it joins Lady Bird Lake. So we'll go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, here's the outline of the tunnel itself. The tunnel itself is one mile long. At the main inlets, at the inlet structure, the tunnel starts at 20 feet diameter. In between, it increases 22.5 feet diameter. And the last leg of it is 26.5 feet diameter before it exits at the outlet and joins again into Lady Bird Lake. The tunnel was constructed uh, to bypass floodwaters. Um, it carries it's capable of carrying 8,000 CFS through the tunnel, which is equivalent to 3.5 million gallons per minute. Uh, so that's the capacity. It was designed back in the uh, late 1990s for 100 floodplain, 100-year uh, floodplain. I know it's changed today, but that's how it was designed back in 1990. Okay, next slide, please. The tunnel itself, the facilities, there's four components to the facility. The main inlet tunnel at Waterloo Park, 8th Street Creekside Inlets, and 4th Street Creekside Inlet, and uh, discharges into Lady Bird Lake at the outlet. The 4th and 8th Street curb in, uh, Creekside Inlets, that's another opportunity for floodwaters to enter the tunnel, because the tunnel is a closed loop tunnel, which it only has three areas for the water to be diverted into the tunnel, and that's at the main inlet, 8th and 4th Street. We'll move on to the next slide. Here's a picture to, to my left is the bar screens or the pond of the main inlet. And there's a, a drawing there uh, of the inlet pond and the main tunnel and the facility as it enters into the facility north of 15 streets. Go to the next slide. 
debris management. Debris, besides uh, flood control, the next main component of the tunnel itself is debris management. What we do here is we remove uh, flow debris, debris from the waterways and we captured here using the Bosco rate system or the net removal and replacement system and we put it into a auger compactor. So what that does for us is we capture debris here at the main inlet and we bypass some flow of, of stormwater down the creek, but majority of the trash and debris gets collected here. So that gives a, a, a cleaner water flow going down south to 12th Street to Ladybird Lake. Next slide. Creekside inlets at 4th and 8th. And again, there's another opportunity for the floodwaters in Waller Creek to enter the tunnel. And again, another opportunity for us to screen the water before it enters the tunnels. We got a netting system. Next slide. And here we get the netting system for fourth and eighth. The netting system is a 10 millimeter net where it will capture smaller debris through the net before it enters the tunnel. Again, the quality of the tunnel depends on how clean, uh, clean water we put into it. Next slide. And finally, the discharge at uh, Lady Bird Lake, the outlet. The outlet lagoon has 2.5 acres of water in it, which is equivalent to close to a million gallons of water. So the water uh, comes out of the outlet shaft and goes over a spillway and joins to Lady Bird Lake during a flood event. Next slide, please. All right, so what happens during rain events? Flood, flood water is diverted into a tunnel, and this is how it works. Uh, this last weekend, we had a flood event that upstream, we had about 2,200 CFS going uh, south of, uh, well, from 15th Street to the facility. We bypassed about 100 CFS through our debris, uh, to, through our trailer, through our facility, and we put the remainder 2100 CFS into the tunnel and it flowed to the outlet and joined Lady Burke Lake there. What that does is prevent flooding south of 12th Street, which of course there's other streets that it will distribute water into the creek there and that's where 4th and 8th Street will capture additional flood water into the tunnel. Again, it's designed for 8000 CFS. We haven't seen that. 100 year flood as of date, our biggest event so far has been about 3,200 CFS. So, next slide. Here's our inlet pond. The pond itself has close to 20 acre feet of water, which is equivalent to 6,000 gallons, 6 million gallons, I'm sorry. And at this particular, this one event, uh, we had about 1,500 CFS flowing towards the tunnel. And here's the, the rushing water coming north of us. And you see that wall there, we call that vein wall. What that does is slow down the CFS or the flow of the water before it hits the bar screens to basically nothing, about five CFS. So we had 1,200 CFS this rain event. It got to the bar screens about five CFS. So it really slowed down the water there for us to be able to capture this debris. And this kind of debris that we get into our pond and we remove it with our Bosco raking system. Dry weather mode. During dry weather mode, what do we do? Well, we got to keep continue moving the water in the tunnel so it won't become static. Quality of water, it's it's big thing for us to keep the water in the tunnel at a minimum of three to five uh, oxygen level, uh, milligrams per liter of oxygen level. What do we do there? We have submergible pumps at the main inlet. We pump water from the tunnel back into the creek. A normal flow that we're pumping is about seven CFS, which is equivalent to 3000 gallons per minute. We take out of the tunnel, put it into the creek. What that does is improve the quality of water in the creek, even 
even during dry weather, where if we have a drought in July or, or August, we're able to keep the water moving in the creek. And that's just, that just makes the uh, creek for a healthy creek system. It also reduces the trash. We collect the majority of the trash there at the inlet through the Bosco raking system. Tomas, I'd like to just add just really quick in uh, when it comes to the dry weather flows and part of part of our responsibility uh, in our partnership with the Conservancy and its watershed department is to is to look at creek improvements along Waller Creek. So the stretch that the, the tunnel uh, is recirculating flows for, which is about a mile and a half long of, of, of creek space, that water, which would typically not be there, provides uh, base flow or low flows within the channel that the design for the creek improvements has to respond to. So there's there's opportunities for us to look at how the creek will function and improve uh, the ecological function because of that recirculated flow. So it's a new flow regime in this space, but, it's, it, but it is also exciting for us as a design team to kind of explore options for how we would, how we would improve the channel uh, with with this with space or this modified kind of space flow condition. Thank you. Thanks for that, Kristen and Thomas. And now um, I'm gonna we're gonna switch over to a virtual view. Um, so Kristen, you should be able to go ahead and start leading us through that. Okay. And with this, and I I'd like to present this as a, kind of a, a draft model. And and it's really exciting, I believe, for watershed. And Tomas will lead us on this on our guided virtual tour. But this is hot off the press. This is a beta version of uh, kind of a photo document series that our department put together to kind of document and be able to virtually walk through the operations facilities for the tunnel. And this group is the first. Uh, is the first um, audience for this effort. So uh, apologize if it's kind of if there's a clunky in how we walk through here, but I think you are going to find this extremely exciting and it's going to be a lot more telling about what Tomas and his staff, uh, the conditions they work in and the facilities they operate on a daily basis. Uh, but with that, I, I will kind of guide the tour or the walk, but Tomas will be leading the talk. And so I'll, Thomas, I'd like to pass it back to you and kind of show uh, show show the group. You know, what are we looking at right now? What is what is this uh, a view of? Yes. So I'm going to go ahead and stop uh, sharing my screen, Kristen, so you can pull that up. Oh, okay. I thought I was already on. My, my apologies. Can can everyone see my screen? No. Not yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then I have my technical difficulties. Okay. Have you sent me a request to share my screen? Or is it should it be automatic? Um, you should be able to um, click at the bottom next to the camera and mic um, to go ahead and share your screen. How about now? There we go. Yes. Okay. I think I will see, try to minimize this if I can. I'd like to remove this. There we go. I think that's as clear as it's going to be. Okay. So here, and again, so with what I was mentioning a second ago, this is the the rollout of a beta version of a virtual tour tour of the tunnel facilities. So this is very much a draft and in, in review by our staff right now, but given the timing and the intent of this presentation, we thought it would be exciting for this audience to, to go on a virtual walk of the, of the facility itself. But, and again, with that, um, I'll, I'll pass it over to Thomas to kind of lead us on the walk and I will just kind of control the uh, control it from here. So Thomas, uh, if you could kind of introduce everybody to what, what we're seeing on screen right now. Okay, yeah, we're at uh, the south parking lot of the facility, the main inlet facility. 
and you, we got two overhead doors there and we're going to go through one of them. I'm not sure which one it is, but let's get started. All right, so yeah, walking in. That operate the, uh, this facility. And it's not a 24 hour uh, operational facility. It's only 40 hours a week, but we do have a SCADA system that we monitor as far as uh, operation of the equipment and there and so forth. Here's uh, some of our gate actuators. Zimitork is the actuator that we actually use. And this is where all the water is underneath us, really. And this is the floor level at 486, mean sea level. When we talk about uh, levels, we reference uh, mean sea level as MS, MSL. We're looking, we're going to go down to the lower chamber, which is called our lower wet well at this time. Oh, excuse me, that's the upper wet well. The upper wet well, what we do, that, that chamber takes water out of the pond and diverts it through the facility back into the creek. We got a screening cage down there that, again, from the bar screens, we screen it one more time, though, the water through 10 millimeter openings through our cage system here. So let's go over there to the right hand side over there. Oh, wait, it's a little bit too far. Would you, would you like to walk out on the deck? No, I want to sh uh, show the lower wet well. Oh, then I would. So right next to it. What we're looking at is uh, one of our collection debris carts. And we'll walk into the deck right now. This is north of the facility, and this is where our railing Bosker system runs through. We're looking north to 15th Street at this time. What we have is again, a the Bosker, yeah, and, and the rail system for the Boskers, the, yeah, the debris management system is here. There is six bays, and we call them 1A, 1B, because they got two different screens there, and that's what you see there as far as on the wall there. Six bays. Each bay has two screens. And we'll keep on going to the right there. Hanover, south. And this is our deck area. As you can see, we got a half roof in there. Uh, we do want it a full closure as far as the roof there, because there at the grate, you saw that before we pan back, pan back, pan back uh, we'll see the, uh, the grate over the morning glory or the inlet shaft. All right. Yeah. Do you want me to keep moving this way? Yes, keep on moving. You, you got it. You got to keep on panning to the uh, right. Oh, we moved it. All right. So we'll go back into the facility. And there is to the right, one pan to the right, and we'll go back into the chambers. The lower chamber has four submergible pumps and the upper chamber has also four submergible pumps. The lower chamber, which is as low as Lady Bird Lake at elevation 428, pumps water from the tunnel that is equivalent to elevation of Lady Bird Lake to this elevation of 486. And the upper wet well pumps water from the pond elevation at 473 to this elevation of 486 again. And that's water gets recirculated through the pond. And the lower wet well we recirculate to. Go ahead and hit that arrow right there. Hit this arrow? Okay. Yes, that one there. We'll go back into here. Okay. Let's go to the arrow facing the guys there. We're going left. There you go. All right. Let's pan back. Uh, 
Okay, right there, we have Richard Gibson looking at our cage system or debris management system at the lower wet well. And I believe we're able to go down the lower wet well. Is there uh, an icon to kick to turn on and uh, for us to go down? I'm not familiar with the one that's here, but I, I am. Okay. But we might be able to do something similar at uh, the outlet. We'll pan back to the left and look at the auger compactor system. We use a 10 ton forklift to pick up the carts that are full when they're full with debris from the Bosker and we put it into auger compactor. So go forward. Let's see what that leads us to. All right, it's going to go into our control room. Let's open the door to the electrical control room. See what we find in there. All right, here's our switch gear. This is uh, where all the power comes in. You see those four panels right there in front of us. Those are variable frequency drives for our eight pumps that we have here. So the pumps, they're regulated through a VFD or variable frequency drives where we're able to control the the flow or the the operating of the pumps through the variable frequency drives, which is all frequency driven, not voltage driven. We have, as you see the conduit on there, we got about four miles of conduit through the whole building. And we then here was the uh, displays there for seeing uh, the concept before it was built. The inlets there to the left and the outlet to the right. So we could get out of this room already. Okay. Would you like to uh, walk down to the, the ramp now? So we can yes. see, we can make our way down there. So we're going to move away from the, the inlet building itself and work our way, let's see if I get back here, work our way down to the bottom of the pond. So that folks can see, get a, a sneak peek into that too. And what you're seeing there, those forks right there, if you stop right there and talk about the outer compactor, the carts are put onto those forks. And let's go forward to the uh, those forks there. And maybe we'll have a, Okay, we're out of there. And we're back to the parking lot. And we can switch to the pond. Yeah, I'm looking, sorry, I'm looking for it right now. <laughs> platform, platform, entrance, it's not it. What you're seeing is more of the switch gear, the motor mm -hmm. control center. This is a user error, so I apologize. <laughs> I'm trying to. Let's do a video in, uh, web wheel inspection. That's a good one. Okay. All right, this is my favorite part. We're going to go down to the lower wet well, and that's about 80 feet from the deck. So again, the deck is at elevation 486, and we're going to go down to it. Elevation 428. We have this camera mounted into a man basket and we, with our overhead crane, we dropped it into this opening in the grates. I am so sorry. Like and all the way around the mad basket, there's going to be an icon to hit so you can continue going. So it'll show us going down. Oh, 
Okay, and you wanted me to keep moving here? Yeah, just spam, spam uh, 360 around and look at the command basket. And I believe there was an icon for it to, to click on. Okay. And there we go. Continue moving it around. I don't think I can move that right now. Okay. Right, right. No, here we go. Okay. Keep going. Yeah, the man basket there, we have a, the video, we have the camera on the man basket and it's going to be lowered down to the lower right. Well, can we see that? Okay, probably not. Well, let's get out here and move on. There you go. The entrance, the first one, the inlet ramp entrance. All right. So, so again, this perspective, if you from John's presentation, is this area is just north east of where the performance venue is. So this is an earlier stage of where you can see the venue being constructed. And this is the road that leads out to 14th Street and Trinity. So we are on the, the west side of the park. But just to kind of give you an idea of where we of where we are in the park right now. Um, we'll come back around and then we can start walking down the ramp. And this route will take us along the bottom of the pond when the when uh, there isn't any water in it. So you guys can get a sense of the size of the space, the path that the water flows when um, when it's moving through the facility itself. And then we can also, and, and at the end of it, we're gonna actually be able to walk into the bottom of the inlet facility where the debris collection systems are. So it's pretty, it, that part is pretty fascinating. So we're in the pond area and it's dry at this time. The pond, we drain it three or four times a year to remove sediment and larger debris that didn't get through the bar streams that actually sunk into the, to the bottom and we drained the pond to remove the sediment and the float of debris that got waterlogged. So we're entering the bar screen. So again, the water goes through the bar screens at, at, at the elevation of 473. And the bottom screens were purposely removed for if we ever have the bar screens that are that are clogged up and we're not able to rake them with the Bosker system, the water still has a path to go through the bottom of the screens and go over the morning glory. That shaft that we're looking at right now, we call that the morning glory. That from the top to the bottom, the invert of the tunnel, it's 60 feet. So the water crosses, you can see that water line there. That's the normal pull elevation. So that's about it. We got a, a foot before it crests the morning glory normal elevation. At 473 is the water mark and the top of the morning glory or the entry to the tunnel is at 474. So as water arises and comes into the facility, it crosses the top of this, this pipe here and goes into the tunnel. The shaft itself is 20 feet diameter. As you can see, this was after a cleanup and there's some, you can see mud down there. Uh, typically we take out somewhere from 500 to 2000 pounds of mud and float over debris during a cleanup. It depends on what cycle of the year, if it's either in the spring, the fall, the summer or the winter time. And of course the fall is when we get the most of the debris because of the of the fall of the leaves falling and so forth. And so let's move. And from here, would you prefer to go back out into the pond floor or would you like to take a sneak peek at the outlet? Yeah, let's get out of, out of let's go back to the vein wall. Again, there are six bays, and each bay has two screens. Uh, did we go through all that already? 
you talking about from here? You want to go back to, to see the, the front of it? This piece? Yeah, let's go to the outlet. Oh, go to the outlet. Okay, I uh, apologize. I misunderstood you. The pool of water there at the inlet with the dry pond, it's about 19 feet. You can see that water mark there. So it goes from zero to 19 feet as it ramps down. And here we're at the outlet. So now we've traveled from, you know, as we, the presentation has mentioned, that the, the tunnel runs the length uh, a mile and a half long from Waterloo to Lady Bird Lake. And the outlet, in, for folks who've gone along the Butler Trail and uh, are in this area, you can see the pond wall. Uh, but now, again, we're going to kind of take a tour of when, when the water's down, what the bottom, what the floor of the facility looks like, and then also be able to kind of walk into the tunnel, which is something you can't see on, on a dry weather day. So right now, we're right along Lady Bird Lake kind of and walking down into the pond. And typically, if you're on Butler Trail, you have a perspective from here along the fence line. And then this is the area where there's a bridge across uh, Waller Creek in this area here. So again, this is a service ramp so that the operations team can get to the bottom of the facility when they're doing these cleanouts and for other, you know, issues that might come up from an operations perspective. Um, but then, Thomas, uh, if you could give everybody a sense of what we're looking at from here, that'd be great. All right. This is the uh, the floor of the lagoon, the outlet lagoon there, and that's the water level, the water height there normally is about 14 feet. And here, what we have here is during one of our, our pond cleanup, I mean, I'm sorry, the tunnel cleanups. What we're doing is um, the site was every two years, we drain the tunnel and we go into the tunnel and remove sediment or other debris that is entered into the tunnel through the bar screens and so forth. So we're averaging about, Two to 3,000 tons of sediment that is accumulated in the tunnel during this cycle of two years. And this was a contractor that was pumping water out of the tunnel and a crane that would put a mad basket into the tunnel. And I think. If you pan over to the man basket, there's going to be an icon for us to go down into the tunnel. So go the other way. There's the Not man here. basket. And we're going to click on that. And here's the man basket that we're going to go enter into the outlet tunnel. The shaft itself is 40 feet down from the lagoon bottom. I believe I'm having some issues getting with getting the video to play. That happened in the last one as well. But I, I do know that we can we can walk. We can also walk down there as well. So we might just try that really quick. So again, this is in and and can you remind everyone what the diameter of of the tunnel is here yeah the shaft right there is 40 feet in diameter at this point here and the depth from here down to the floor of the tunnel is how far that is 40 feet 40 feet down so right now we're standing at the edge and again this is something that you don't see on a normal dry weather day because it's buried below the pond and now we're going to kind of travel down to the bottom and be able to look up as well so here we're at the floor of the tunnel where all the water that gets diverted into the tunnel at Waterloo Park comes out in daylight at Lady Bird Lake.
to get a perspective of standing on the floor of the tunnel, 40 feet down, looking up at the, the floor of the pond. Thomas, is there anything else you'd like to kind of note about uh, as about this photo? That is, we got uh, there's three skid steer out in there that the contractor put in to scrape the mud, push it down to this location, and with the with the vector suction vehicles, they were able to suck up the mud 40 feet to the vectors, and that's how they actually clean or remove the sediment out of the tunnel here. And if you, I think you okay. go into the tunnel itself by hitting that arrow. I'm sorry? Yeah, hit, the, hit, hit that arrow there and we enter the tunnel itself. So now we're into the main tunnel. The main tunnel, this diameter is 26 feet diameter. And you can see the mud line there. That's how much mud there was down there during this tunnel cleaning. So that was less than 10% of clogging of the tunnel. So the purpose of cleaning the tunnel is so we have the full capacity of 8,000 CFS of water going through there. If we ignore to uh, remove the sediment out of the tunnel, then we can lose capacity of water flow going through the tunnel. And Thomas and Kristen, we have about 10 minutes left. So I wanted to read a couple questions that we've gotten, if that's okay with y'all. Yes. Sure, I, I'll kind of bring up, bring the picture back up to Waterloo Park. I think to some extent, this was kind of the, the end of the virtual tour of the facility. Um, but kind of, yeah, I think it kind of bring closure to that piece. But sure, please, ask away. Yeah, that's great. So um, we have a question about this tool that you guys have been showing us today and if it would be available to the public in the future. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're using this um, and just some context for folks? And I can provide some context. I mean, as I had mentioned uh, previously, that this is very much a draft form and in a beta version that, the, that, the, that our department is reviewing right now. And I, I believe that is one of the aspirations is for this to be available to the public. It might not be as long um, as what we're, as what we're viewing today, but yes, I believe that that is one of the intents is for it's for the public to be able to to see and experience the the tunnel as well. But it's 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 very much a, a beta version document right now and in draft and in review. That's great. Thank you. So everyone who's tuning in today and folks who watch the recording are really getting a special view behind the scenes. Um, we also have a question um, related to the outtake. So the point that we were just at from the floor of the tunnel to the outtake. Um, Thomas, can you tell us again what that what that height is from the floor to the top of the tunnel? Yeah, definitely. The invert of the tunnel at that location is 373 means cell sea level and the uh, spillway is at 431. So through the calculation there, we're about 60 feet from the invert of the tunnel to the spillway. Thank you. And then we have a question about the tunnel operations um, and someone has asked where the sediment goes. The sediment that we picked that up? Yes. <laughs> Kristen, would you like to answer that one? That 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 is part of the debris management system. I mean, I, I mean, I believe, I believe what is actually cleaned up out of the tunnel then is is, is just moved to a, a waste facility. Isn't that right? And that and, right. and, if, yeah. and then as far as like, uh, I mean, the sediment that um that makes it through that actually kind of makes it through the the pond and into the creek you know that would operate as a as a typical system would where it's transported down a creek and then down into it would discharge into lady bird lake so it, it it really just kind of depends on the context of it but there's multiple ways that sediment moves through the facility there's some of there's obviously there's a there's a debris cleanup and sediment removal that happens at the inlet pond itself 
because that is a place where a lot of sediment settles out. Uh, then there's material, as you know, Tomas just mentioned as well, that it's fine enough that it makes it through the grates that are on the on the on the front walls of the inlet facility and makes it into the tunnel. And and if that water isn't moving fast enough, sometimes it it can settle settle out there. And and hence why there is there's an operation to come in and clean up some of that material. But but in general, uh, you know, it's you have the the operational the operations, you know, removing it from the facilities and taking it to um, a waste site or it's it moves through kind of natural means, which is through a creek and then and then and into Ladybird Lake. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then we have another question about the operations of the tunnel and the reverse function of pumping water onto the creek itself. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that? I know we, we covered it a bit in your slides, um, but if you could just give us yeah. um, some more information about that functionality. Sure, and I don't know if it'd be helpful to, to, bring, back, to bring the slides back to the presentation, but I can definitely speak to it. Um, let me, yeah, let me, yeah, I'm going to switch back over. You may, there we go. Thank you. I think that the slide is, is very helpful. And to me that uh, on the dry weather day, that's one of the exciting functions of the tunnel is that it, that this area of creeks, it, it becomes kind of a, it becomes like a living natural science laboratory where you're able to, to, uh, to design features around uh, a, a base flow system. But the recirculation system itself is, and again, it, there's, it's a reverse pump system that pulls water from the pond and from Lady Bird Lake through the tunnel and then where, where it recirculates, and you'll see it, there's a few different ways that the water is introduced back into Waller Creek. Uh, one of the means is over the grate system. Like when we were looking at the inlet facility and you have the, the debris cleaning facilities there, there's what's in front of that is on a, on a dry weather day, it's called a DO ladder, where it it, it creates some disturbance in the water, reintroducing oxygen to the water, improving um, the dissolved oxygen levels in the water, and then it's discharged into the pond. And then there is a, a 30 in, 36 inch pipe within the dam wall that holds the pond back, but allows for some water and some connectivity through the dam. So that, that feature was one that was unique about this facility and allowed for hydrologic, or hydraulic and ecologic connectivity through the dam, but that's that. So the water moves through there and then gets reintroduced back into uh, Lower Waller Creek. Thank you for that. Tomas, um, yeah, and I think just real quick, as Thomas actually mentioned as well, on a dry weather day, and you can, if you were to Google USGS rain gauges or the, the flow gauges, you can actually track this as well from your home. But on a typical day, the tunnel is usually uh, recirculating water about seven CFS uh, or cubic feet per second. Uh, but it has the ability to, to be adjusted between basically between three and 28 CFS is what the, the variability is. Well, this has been a very helpful behind the scenes look of the tunnel. Uh, thank you, Thomas and Kristen. Did you have any final thoughts before we close it out here. Tomas, do you have any? I mean, I appreciate you being able to <laughs> step in, so thank you. But yeah, do you have any do you have any comments or, or thoughts in closing? We do do uh, we do uh, we do offer uh, actual tours once we get over this uh, this spell that we're going through. We have actual tours that uh, I believe we open up to the public once in a while. So I'd like to see you come out here to the facility when those tours uh, resume. That's all I got. Yeah, that's a great reminder. Um, and we'll make sure to help share that information. Normally we do monthly site tours, um, but with the current COVID crisis, uh, we wanna keep everyone engaged with what's going on. So please um, keep following our virtual series. Uh, and then when, when time allows for us to see each other in person, we will share those opportunities with everyone as well. 
Um, thank you to everyone who has joined us today on this virtual tour. Um, we do have a few additional Waterloo in Place programs coming up very soon. On Friday, we have another virtual art class um, with Vanessa from Rankita Sewing and Designs, who will walk us through an at-home beginner's uh, sewing lesson with how to make your own face mask. Um, and then next Wednesday, we have another exciting virtual tour, um, taking a look at our family pavilion with the Office of Michael Shu Architecture. These programs wouldn't be possible without support from our community, including our 2020 program sponsors, BBVA, the PAL Foundation, Susan Bond Foundation, Waterloo Sparkling Water, and The Word Company. And if you all, as you're watching or in your networks, are interested in supporting us as well, we have opportunities available at waterloogreenway.org where you can support us with a gift or maybe purchase one of our um, cool merch that we have for sale. Um, you can also find information about our programs and project uh, online at waterloogreenway.org. Thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Bye everyone.